A beautiful day in Missoula, Montana, January 28th, 2022. Hey guys, I'll drop the voice and get right into it. It's time for Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp, and today we're going to be talking about a bunch of different things. We got uh, some city council where they're going to be diving into uh, 2021's uh, comprehensive COVID update with the new uh, health director, Deshaun Barnett. Also, we're going to talk about some of the big news items that are happening in the world today. Um, we also have a new dub and stuff. We got some new pre-critic and more. So let's kick things off with uh, what's happening in um, uh, just the general news uh, cycle. Uh, top stories, U.S. truckers are protesting Canada's vaccine mandate that went into effect January 15th, which required anyone going in and out of their country to be fully vaccinated. The truckers shipping goods between the lower 48 states to, Alas fr to Alaska, to and from Alaska, and more have been working all through the pandemic. And in recently, many companies spanning that driving stretch has lost more than 80% of their workforce. Also, schools are uh, debating with parents and public opinion about masks in their school. And as Omicron phases uh, begin to end a lot of people, many people are leaning on schools to remove said masks as the right time. Um, not to uh, not to just those who are unvaccinated, but those who believe that they shot up and no longer need to wear a mask for the safety of the unvaccinated, which was the original sentiment. Uh, we are on point where a lot of cracks in logic are starting to show. You have on one hand that one group that wants to stop the spread and those who believe that the risks are so minimal uh, because they are vaccinated, they can withstand this and future mutations of the COVID-19 strain. So those are kind of like the uh, the mindset that's going on in around the world today. But we're moving on into international news. Potential World War, th world War III uh, is looming in the air while the U.S. is looking to handle the UK thing. Uh, many other countries are looking for a diplomatic solution, are in talks. Uh, their continental neighbor and so far the u.s press secretary told all u.s citizens uh in ukraine uh where the conflict is happening to uh, return home who are stationed in the ukraine as tensions build other countries on the continent uh, on the continent are trying to figure out ways to curb tensions by joining the u.s and uk in monday's talks where the leaders of france Germany, Italy, Poland, and the EU. And so far, you know, the, 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 it's always fluid. There's a lot of new information going on here. So everything that I'm saying right now is outdated. And uh, part of this is that the U.S. wrote, uh, uh, the, the Russians wrote a letter of their demands, exactly what they want. Um, one of the big things is they don't want NATO in Ukraine. And uh, them bordering up on the, U uh, on the borders of Russia and Ukraine have made people in Ukraine kind of nervous. And at the same time, uh, NATO forces have been deployed there. Uh, U.S. is sending um, uh, military-grade equipment there as well. So there's just a lot of things happening there. There's a lot of moving parts. Um, and honestly, one of the things that the U.S. is looking to, uh, in turn, uh, allies must enact swift retribution responses, including an unprecedented package of sanctions. Um, so that was one of the big things that everyone agreed on in terms of how they would handle Russia. Hit them with their wallets and trade becomes harder and many folks in Russia will have a harder time getting imports. Russia has seized Ukrainian territories uh, before when it annexed Crimea in uh, 2014. Um, after Russia forces seized and control, Crimea voted to join Russia in the referendum the West and Ukraine deemed illegal. Uh, Russia has done things in the past and I'm assuming the West, U.S. wants troops at the border while others are trying to pr uh, pursue and put pressure on Russia from the outside. And scary times, and uh, we're prepared to possibly go into another Cold War era, uh, era conflict with Russia as the leaders, not just Vladimir Putin, uh, does next. So one of my favorite shows, we're going to switch gears completely and not even have a good segue. We're talking about Arthur, you know, the popular kids show, something that I used to watch as a kid growing up as well. After 25 seasons and pretty much over 45 years of existence, the uh, popular kids show about the aardvark Arthur talks about real family issues and allowing uh, the characters fail, then succeed in their own victories, has made this cartoon unique over the past 40 plus years. One of the biggest, uh, uh, w when they released their first book, uh, it was basically about Arthur and the uh, necessi ne necessity to wear glasses over his uh, vanity. So that was kind of like the first kind of step that kind of broke uh, records and just kind of spent uh, 
put uh, Arthur on a collision course with today, in which they will be wrapping up their final season, which will be 25 seasons, and this will be their final season, and they will be, uh, this, the, the show's final, uh, final premiere is February 21st. So, and of course, I r usually make fun of produced shows and movies, but this one, you know, kind of hit home a little bit, like a good heart attack. Uh, also, in climate news, Virginia has made some major progress in a lawsuit against big oil companies, and this is kind of like a spread. It's not just one in particular. A Virginia court has ruled that the case that oil companies are compli uh, compliant in their uh, contribution to greenhouse gas emissions and may be liable for climate damages. And it's not necessarily about climate change per se, it's more about the misinformation and basic uh, gaslighting and saying, it's like, oh, don't worry, we're, 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 we're uh, drilling oil and we're doing this. Like, we're doing everything we can to prevent any kind of ecological disaster or anything like that. And uh, this Virginia case and people representing this are just like, hey, listen, like, you know Th there's a consensus going around that most people know that your actions and some of the things are uh, contributing to climate change. So the whole idea is that you know you're doing something wrong and you're keeping on doing it. So that's what the case is about. It's not necessarily about the fact that it's creating climate change. It's the fact that they're knowingly creating climate change. It's kind of like uh, if somebody like premeditated climate change, uh, that kind of Th that kind of deal. So, in a statement on behalf of oil and gas companies, attorney Canon uh, Shamungen argued that state court is a wrong place for lawsuits because climate change is a global in scope and is regulated by federal government and by international agreements. However, if they can prove that this company has direct in directly impacted Baltimore, where where the, this wh where this case was filed, that'd be the actual proof in the pudding, and most importantly, get them in get them to be accountable for what has been said in terms of their contribution. So, however, much like many other companies like Big Pharma, one can imagine that Big Oil might try to settle this and make it hard for future lawsuits. So the whole idea is that they're looking for uh, kind of like a golden parachute in a way. So they pay a settlement and much like the Sackler family trying to prevent any further lawsuits against their family and while they distance themselves from the opioid crisis. Um, of course, I'm making comparisons. I just want to make sure that there are two different companies but there's a lot of uh, similarities about in terms of practices and how they do this moving forward. But this is going to be a long process and any lawyer may be reluctant to pursue big oil as they have uh, pressured uh, lawyer uh, Steven Donzinger, who actually took on Chevron uh, directly uh, in for the uh, in um, in the inhabitants of the rainforest of Ecuador. And so they went to court and they successfully sued uh, Chevron in a case involving oil pollution in the rainforest of Ecuador. Um, and then he got uh, uh, ruled in contempt for not releasing information uh, that was cr uh, critical to his case and his uh, representatives of Ecuador. So as a result, he got a six month sentence for contempt, which is never, uh, a lawyer has never gone to jail for a contempt in court ever. And so there's a lot more information about this. I suggest you look up uh, Stephen Donzinger a little bit more about this. But then again, this is just kind of opens the door for potential more lawsuits as well, uh, just to look forward on this. But this is an example how things can get uh, you know, just uh, kind of thing, just kind of like a can of worms have basically just been open, and we're going to kind of see how this all turns out in the future. And so, you know, a lot of things happening in uh, Missoula. Uh, it, we're going to talk about the COVID numbers. Uh, so, you know, we have the new uh, health director, Deshane Barnett, with the Missoula Health Department, re reflect on the 2021 uh, COVID year. And during City Council, we'll talk a little bit more about this in numbers. But of course, this week has seen the biggest spike ever with over 500 new cases reported just this week and an average about 300 cases over a seven day average. January 27th marked a jump from 300 new cases to approximately 594 new cases of COVID. Missoula's death rate is on track to pass 200 deaths related to COVID, unfortunately. Uh, overall, Missoula has seen well over 23,000 cases over the span of the pandemic which remind you we have 119,000 people in the Missoula County Missoula area as well. That's a big chunk however. We see uh, we 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 should always look at the amount of people actually being hospitalized and so far the numbers are 23 of Missoula residents and 26 of non-Missoula residents are currently hospitalized for COVID related treatment. Um and this information is available at missoulainfo.com under the current uh it's called the data dashboard and it is a actually I can kind of show you guys a little bit about this and it and it kind of sh and it shows you a good spread of pages and just kind of informational kind of stuff you can see graphs and all this stuff new cases and all the spikes and all the stuff that are happening here I, and this is 
really good rather than just you know straight up googling it as well so that's kind of what's happening in the news and around uh, here today so we're going to jump over to an art clip from the Mizzou Art Museum featuring Neil Ambrose Smith and when I come back we're going to talk about some movies that are coming out this weekend <laughs> Some great stuff over at the Resort Museum, and you guys can check that out. Uh, free admissions, free expression. It is, it is a great, wonderful, uh, mini art museums that actually don't have uh, uh, basically just walk-ins. So this is one of the few museums in the country that actually has a free to just walk in and look at some of the art. So it's a great way for people to get exposed to some of the arts here in Missoula. Um, let's talk about some things that are happening. It's time for Pre-Critic, where I pre-judge a movie, whether it needs it or not. Kicking things off with another Jaws wannabe movie, but this time, it's French. All right, kick <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that, but uh, why is there always a woman in the poster with a shark? Anyways, The Wreck Quinn is about a shipwreck and a plane wreck, or just a generic wrecked couple in the middle of the ocean looking to survive the elements, and I believe a shark, obviously. The poster does not imply a shark is in this movie anyway, so who, who <laughs> I imagine their bad relationship is put on hold for survival horror that makes a couple stronger because they made it through this horrific thing, therefore they can stay together. It's like, hey, you know, this whole thing was traumatic. You know, our relationship doesn't seem that traumatic by far, so, you know, trauma bonding is great, right? A term made popular by stand-up comedian Whitney Cummings, but doesn't mind, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay, so here is uh, another attempt at a Jaws again. Uh, did I mention Requiem? Uh, the title is French for shark, and I totally butchered that because I don't speak French, nor do I have any uh, idea how French uh, works. I don't know why I'm talking about myself. But anyways, up next we have Clean from the uh, prestigious Oscar winner actor uh, Adrian Brody is in a D-list action movie about a, I don't know, CSI cleaner or something? Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger is a racer? I don't know, this title is a bit uh, on the nose about clean, which is about a main character who's, uh, I guess it's meant to be ironic, but uh, he's a garbage man. So he's a garbage man with a shady past, and when it comes back, so basically it's like another, it's, okay, ever since John Wick came out, every movie has to have some guy who's like, he was just a mild-mannered whatever guy, and then he became a badass. Not like, you know, Charles Bronson where, you know, he, uh, God, I, I completely forgot what those movies are called, but he did a bunch of those kind of movies where he just, uh, he's just getting revenge, uh, death sentence and death proof, that kind of thing. Uh, those kind of movies where you're just getting revenge for the death of his family, that kind of thing. But these are the kind of ones where they're like, oh, they already have a shady past and they already have such a history of all that stuff. But, you know, anyways, I have no idea what this movie is about, but pretty much it's just pretty much like, He's a clean, his name's clean, he's a garbage man, they mess with the wrong garbage man, boom. Uh, them bad guys should have never bothered that garbage man. The next one would be like, he was just a regular drag queen looking to hide from his past, but with the help of RuPaul and the gang, will this person do the thing that gets them the thing to the thing of the thing? Of course, I'd watch this over a garbage man movie any day. So, up next we have uh, kind of a foreign film, maybe about... Um, 
cannibalism or whatever, but this movie's called Taste of Hunger. Jamie Lannister stars in an indie film about a couple who sacrifice everything to achieve the highest possible accolade in the culinary world. Uh, um, uh, Michelin star, uh, if you are European, congratulations, you know something about culinary things. But as a drama, this kind of shows the intense uh, cutthroat world of uh, high-profile chefing and restaurants in the world can be. It's not about the money, it's about reputation. People in Europe have killed themselves because of how serious they take their culinary skills. They've gotten bad reviews for their food, and it doesn't work out in, for them in the end. But anyways, fine dining, be whack, and I assure this movie will fall under the radar as January ends and rom-coms start airing over the month of February. All right, up next we have a new dub and stuff for you guys, and it is uh, about a woman, and she is on the run. It is from the 1950 movie, Woman on the Run, and without further ado, and as I'm trying to delay, we're going to premiere this for you guys. All right, all right, let's get this show on the road. <coughs> Newspaper time. Well, your test results came through, and yes, you are 100% that, oh, Oh, my mistake. Um, I guess you're the another patient I have uh, wants to know what percentage of heritage she is, and I, you know, looked that up and it found out that she's 100% that, uh, well, it's not really appropriate for this particular conversation. I need some plastic surgery. I'm not that kind of doctor, ma'am. I'm the kind of doctor that, you know, gives prescriptions out, gives people drugs, and, you know, makes them feel good and stuff. Plus, the surgery you're asking for is controversial. Uh uh I mean, like, perhaps in the next 50 years or so, while technology improves more and more, I'm assuming that... I just want to be a Muppet, okay? Well, that's possible, but you would have to cut into, like, felt, and you'd need a seamstress or somebody who can sew or anything like that. I can pay you. <laughs> I do like money. And after all, that's why I became a doctor. I don't want to look like Janice from the Muppets band. She looks like she's already had work done. And I don't want to look like I have work done. I want to look perfect. Perfection is hard to reach, ma'am. After all, you know, nobody's perfect, and I know that because I like to say Poe Buddy's nerfic. It's a pun where you switch the first two letters of both words, perfect and nobody. I think it's funny. But, you know, this surgery, you're mixing meat with uh, inanimate objects and chemicals. Well, in case you change your mind. It's not about me making up my mind. It's an ethical decision. Like, I might go into surgery with you, and you might end up looking like Oscar the Grouch. Do you want to look like a trash can monster? I don't think so. I don't think that's a good idea, especially for your complexion. Well, thanks for accidentally wasting my time. Oh, wait, hold on there a second. I'll be on my way. No, listen, I'm really sorry that if I could... If it meant anything, you could have changed the world. Waiting for this lady on the street. Hopefully she knows that I'm not following her. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, oh, mm -hmm, a doctor! Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to be a Muppet! Mm -hmm. Alright, time to check this thing that... What am I doing again? Um, hmm. Darn, I can't think of what I'm trying to do. Uh, huh. mm. Oh, she um, looked... I can hear you thinking back there. Okay, I think I lost him. <laughs> oh, hey! I'm sorry about my gross flush lips, but I need to kiss you. See, is that good? Is that good enough? I, I, I can't. I just want to be a Muppet. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me. Um, can you tell me about that Muppet wannabe? Absolutely not. I don't know that huh, girl. A likely story. She kissed you. That was my first sir, kiss. Sir, I need you to focus for a second. Why are you following her around anyways? You some kind of boyfriend or whatever? Here's my card. I'm a private investigator. Yoink, just kidding. <laughs> I live at home with my parents. Yeah, I like how at the end he just like gives him his card and then just takes it away. That it just in general is kind of hilarious. Just in my mind, it's like uh, he gives him something just to return, just to take it back. But anyways, let's talk about some city council stuff. Uh, we're uh, kind of into it, uh, you know, as we're getting used to this. This is the first month of the uh, the new city council. We have a bunch of new uh, members as well, and. Kicking things off, um, Vicki Watson, during public comment, gave a shout-out uh, for her birthday, and she had this to say. I'm 69, and almost 40 of those years have been here in Missoula, and I like to celebrate by thanking the folks who have helped me have a good life. So I want to thank you and all of Missoula for working to make Missoula a healthy place where elders can stay active and continue to contribute to the community. We Missoulians have worked together to protect air and water quality, make Missoula bikeable and walkable, work for more safe 
sustainable housing and health care that's affordable to all. There's still a lot to do in these efforts, especially with the rapid population growth we're seeing in climate change, but we are making progress, so thank you. Speaking of climate change, thank you for passing Missoula's Clean Electricity Resolution. And I know that the new council members are just as committed to this goal as those of you who passed the resolution earlier. All right. So, you know, I always like to start off, you know, like it's, it's always nice to start off on a, on a positive note as well. But, um, you know, have nice and love for uh, the city. You know, it's always a thankless, thankless job. They've been uh, moving forward on so many policies, so many things moving forward as well with um, so a lot of backlash, a lot of different things. But for the most part, they're trying to do the best that they can with the circumstance that have been given to them. But uh, throughout the, her comments, she spoke about clean energy and concerns for climate change. Vicki Watson is uh, w worried about the effect of our longer fire seasons and supporting We the People Amendment, which, you know, they did a proclamation at the city council meeting, and I'll just kind of give you the um, overview of We the People was an, uh, a bill that was passed uh, through the state in 2012, which recognizes that uh, corporations are not people, and therefore their money does not represent a voice that uh, to the state level to protect ourselves from corporate interests, and therefore uh, not speech, as they are not private citizens. This proclamation was reaffirmed on Monday's meeting. They usually do it every year. But uh, of course, things always get heated in public comment, and Matt Larson spoke about the potential ties that city council members have with developers and real estate. When Jones calls them out during a point of order, let's listen. Pertaining to conflicts of interest with uh, certain council members who have pending listings as real estate I'm agents. Call a point of order the, on this is not a point of order. You can't, I have not made any personal attacks. Oh my God. That's incorrect and inappropriate. And I've already had a lengthy email exchange today with Mr. Carlino regarding this allegation that Mr. Larson has brought up. It's incorrect. It's unfactual. It's inappropriate. And I don't think this is the right venue in which any of that, which is not even true, should be vetted. Okay, and so in the past, the city have, uh, you know, abstained from certain votes that affects, you know, like if they have some kind of ties to certain private sectors type stuff. And this had a lot to do with a lot of those developments that are happening in the Missoula area. And I mean, the Mullen area with the 54 plus acres, the development is already moving forward. There's already things happening there, regardless of, you know, a person who is a realtor on the side has nothing to do with that kind of stuff. So it's, you know, in the past, there have been conflicts of interest when it comes to developers developing in areas, but when it comes to ongoing projects, the voice has nothing to do with the financial incentives or potential incentives or disincentives that would come from knowing this that's happening. So it's already happening. It's, you know, it's just kind of too little too late. So anyways, Jill Dunn from MRA talks about the fiscal year 2021 amendments and more. So the uh, MRA uh, and many of the things within the city were audited. So here is Jill Dunn talking a little bit of an overview about amending the 2021 budget, which was a result of little updates and grants and monies that are coming in to the city as well throughout 2021. So during the audit process of year end, things kind of move around. They are going through all of your books, expenditures and revenues and making sure everything is categorized correctly. And um, most of our budget amendments have to do with our revenue uh, mill levies coming in after, after the budget is adopted. And then if we, there's any bond issues that are uh, approved by city council, they have to go through city council. They have to be approved before we can ever issue a bond. MRA cannot do that, but those have to be recognized at the end of the year. Okay, so that was one of uh, the many quotes that I'm going to be showing you guys during this segment. Missouri Development does not do anything. The city uh, council does not ha will have the final vote and final say in this, and sometimes they throw it back to the MRA to talk some more and restructure it. And it acts like kind of like a committee that presents projects to the council. And so if you can convince MRA that your project is in the, within the best interest of the community, you can get those tax increment financings to offset costs to certain projects, but at the same time, allow uh, more infrastructure and sidewalk projects to be in conjunction with it, of course. Anyways, Missoulians who hate tips refer back to uh, Missoula Merck as the beginning of a lot of eyebrows being raised as many developers began taking advantage of this tax break program. So Jill Dunn also talks about and shows the audit and its information. It's not really clear in this particular image I'm about to show you, but they have the presentation online that you guys can check out at the city's website, which I will tell you about at the end of my city council report. Here is a copy of our audit income statement for fiscal year 2021. I included this because when I, we did the um, set the public hearing in December, there were some folks that were just looking at that reconciliation spreadsheet. And I wanna point out on those that that includes all of the funds 
that MRA deals with, including all of our debt service funds. And so when you look at the very bottom of that on revenue and expenditures, you're going to see the, some funds that are counted more than once, because when you have debt, it goes into your clearing account, and then it has to come out and go into another account to pay the debt service. And so revenues are counted twice when you look at that. And so um, some of the media were reporting that we had a $30 million budget, which is not true. This number right here on our audited income statement, this 12 million, there's that total column. That is what we're looking at. So. All right. We're looking. So oh, hold on a second. Okay. My other clip just started playing and let's go back to my notes. Okay. So far the projects are funded through uh, another account that can be created as a debt that can be paid off. Part of this is that you're uh, basically transferring uh, from one account to another. Uh, this is not a general fund money as they are part of the urban renewal districts and other forms of specific tax bonds that were passed over the years for this particular thing through the MRA. And so far this is just not, uh, this was just an approval of the audit and it has no effect on how MRA operates. Just an update reflection part of the audit. The city also spoke about the 2021 budget as it reflects about changes and crunching numbers and finalizing the budget from last year for the books. Shirley uh, Kinsey from Parks and Rec talk about the fallout from not increasing fees. So part of this is we're moving in, we're going back into the master fee schedule, which is set to increase the fees within usage of city and county parks. So this is Shirley Kinsey. We're looking at right around a, a $30,000 deficit. Um, combined with uh, triangle fields and the diamond fields, or triangle fields, I say that all the time, um, rectangle fields and, and the diamond fields. Um, so, and then, and then the shelters are, are a, a little, quite a bit less. Um, the fee increase will generate right around $6,000 of revenue to help offset the wage increases across the board. Um, in recreation, we're looking at a 7% increase in wages. Uh, aquatics, a 14% increase in wages. And um, from what I've seen over at Park Operations, because they're in the same boat we are, um, they're looking at a seven, at least a 7% increase in wages as well. Okay. So uh, part of this is that, you know, of course, you know, the city and many other uh, uh, places in the United States are looking to support workers and have that five, 15 minute, uh, $15 minimum wage an hour. And this will help current and uh, future employees. I mean, I mean, most things are getting it more expensive and park recs are investing in the communities. And fortunately, most communities can't couldn't care too much about parks. But Missoula has always had an overwhelming support for our parks and trails. Daniel Carlino talks about the fee increase and how he's gonna vote against it. Wouldn't have to increase the fees if we just attracted more people to play sports. And these fee increases, uh, fee increases going up so drastically will um, also deter some people from being able to participate in Missoula sports. Um, so I believe we should not increase these fees at such a rapid pace uh, because it is pricing some Missoulians um, out of our public parks. And we got some emails about that. Um, just got an email from the president of the um, MSA, the Missoula Softball Association that Shirley was just talking about, um, who was showing that the MSA is against these fee increases. Um, instead of increasing these fees at such a large portion, um, we could work to attract more teams. We could more evenly distribute the fee increases amongst all sports, um, or we could fully fund Parks and Rec in the general fund. And part of this would, um in response to Daniel Carlina's suggestions, you know, like you're trying to uh, promote more people to use our parks. So that means we're going to have to put a fund into actually getting the word out and trying to uh, encourage people to join it. And then at the same time, if you fully fund the parks, that means that's going to be higher taxes within the people as well. So by increasing the fees, you don't have to mess with any of the uh, pay structure that the Parks and Rec have already been doing in, have already been receiving. Uh, so a lot of things are just kind of like, there's a lot of things and a lot of moving parts in this, but this, uh, but my retort was if we are trying to attract m more people to use the park, that would in turn cost more money to do so. Reallocating funds is a solid idea for sure, but through sustainability in our parks, shouldn't rely on one source for all funding as fees help folks reinvest in their communities. I mean, of course, 
I stated last time that a lot of the fee increases would affect Fort Missoula more dras dramatic, uh, drastically with increases in hourly rates, you know, like the over uh, $50 an hour to use the turf field. And, you know, they also have, you know, scholarships for nonprofits and community beneficial events. Uh, otherwise, they'd have to raise taxes. So one of the things that always goes back to is that, you know, like what, whatever they do, there's always going to have to be put, put more more money into it regardless, whether that be, uh, you know, I mean, it's whether it be like overtime for so some of the workers who have to work the overtime to ma uh, maintain and fix the parks and any kind of issues with that. But the whole meeting kind of went back and forth with folks chiming in on the ever inc uh, for on the increases in pretty much average avenue of cost of living and more. Everything's going up and it's unfortunate. And our city body is basically following the times we live in. Uh, Mr. Loomis from the last time spoke in very, uh, very clear about this in terms of uh, nonprofits and the other parks. People don't use it, but still pay for it. So this is what uh, Mr. Loomis said. There is a difference between uh, using a sidewalk and using a rented facility. I made that, that, that comment because they're both public things. But you know, you could, argue, you could argue that lots of facilities, dog parks require certain maintenance and certain um, uh, operations and repairs. I don't use a dog park, but I am paying for it as a taxpayer because that's what we do. I know there's a difference. I don't think it's that big of a difference. Um, I also really like Mr. Hess's uh, suggestion regarding budgeting. And maybe it's because it's becoming a, a bigger issue because the dollars are getting big. Um, I recognize and understand that cost of supplies and wages and everything um, have increases. Parks needs a way to counter some of these increases. And that kind of kind of goes back to what I originally said, which I'll bring up again. Um, Parks, again, has very few means of creating revenue. Uh, General Fund is, I believe, their main source. This is basically out of need, I believe. Um, without additional payroll funding, which is happening because council has dictated, and I'm so sorry if I'm incorrect with this, the city has strongly encouraged Parks and Rec to raise wages. I'm not opposed to that, but it's not their choice. They're being told you need to spend more money on this, but they're not being given more money to spend. That's where this all kind of stemmed from. And so honestly, the it's between the choice of doing nothing or just keeping on keeping on with the current um, status quo within the parks and recreation, which a lot of times there's a lot of progress happening within parks and recreation. Um, they have these new parks. And one of the biggest complaints that also Mr. Loomis uh, referred to in his last public comment was the fact that there's not enough staff members to kind of keep the upkeep and, uh, you know, manage the parks. Hey, we live in a we live in a winter town. So ap approximately uh, eight nine months out of the year, most of the parks are kind of uh, in uh, unusable. It's kind of like it's like one of those things where it's just like you know you really can't justify being outside and that kind of thing when there's like always a chance of rain and there's always a, a, a emergency winter storm warning that kind of thing. You know, Missoula is so common for winter storm warnings. It's like it's not even much of a warning. It's more just like a, a common occurrence. This is the rising tide that happening across all communities, and Missoula voted in favor of this increase in the end. Another big project is sidewalks, and this sidewalk is off of Eaton Street, uh, a block west of Reserve. So uh, Daniel Carlino is not too keen on the funding mechanism in terms of how we are paying for these sidewalks. And this is what he had to say. I do want the sidewalk built, and I'd like to see us uh, complete our sidewalk and boulevard system um, across the city for good community uh, benefit. Um, however, I am concerned about the methods that the city is using to help um, fund sidewalks, like in this example here. Um, with over 40% of Americans not having enough savings to cover $400 emergency expense, emergency expense and that same in that story being the same in missoula sidewalk costs should not be um, the emergency uh, expense that tips missoulians over the financial edge uh, giving a bill to missoulians in the cost of thousands of dollars for a sidewalk adjacent to their home doesn't make sense as the best uh, most equitable funding system this is a high cost bill to put on residents and the system is not um and i just think that we need to uh, i just think the system is not the best and we have other options to fund sidewalks so in the future i'd like for us to take a look at um, not putting a bill of thousands of dollars or um or putting people into debt for having a sidewalk adjacent to their house so i actually was on daniel carlino's side for the first part of this meeting but as i watched more and more into this meeting uh 77 000, uh from this neighborhood and the city will pitch in the 
$683,000 for this. Mind you, infrastructure bill pack, you know, passed and many projects will be on the horizon as construction season, season inches closer and closer. This is actually a big chunk of sidewalk because I did a shoot back in 2019, just kind of referring back to some of my old things w that I did with MCAT in the city, is that they spoke about this uh, in terms of cost of sidewalk, you know, and this is at 2019 times, and I know the cost of materials have gone up like crazy, but it was about uh, $800,000 for a one mile uh, stretch of sidewalk. And since uh, then, you know, all materials and stuff have increased. Overall, now is the time for many investments like the Eaton Street, all the neighbors in that particular area will be paying the $77,000 of an over uh, nearly $800,000 ticket price for a sidewalk. So in a way, it is it is an investment, but it's also uh, you know one of those things like Daniel R. Carolino is also saying is that we're constantly edging to the edge of a cliff uh, pertaining to a lot of funding and our fixed incomes. So uh, based on the area I live off Eden, uh, you know, it is in dire need of sidewalks because there are too many times I've come close to uh, people just walking down the, the, the street because there's no like sidewalks or the road's not even big enough to support people being able to walk down the street. So there's a, a good chunk of this area. And this is going to be covering uh, sidewalks from 7th through uh, 13th Street and beyond. So it's, it's gonna be a, a reasonable chunk, uh, both sides sidewalks. It's just gonna, uh, honestly, like this kind of investment, you know, it's gonna be, gonna be very cheap for the homeowner, but, in the, in, in, but also in the long term with the sidewalks, create a safety and also um, increase property values in the, in, in the time that we're living in as well. So I'm, um, the, you know, there's a lot of things going both ways. Uh, I, I'm not so keen on the price, but I'm also keen on the fact that this is gonna be a comprehensive savings uh, in the long term because in terms of sidewalks, there's not that many sidewalks in Missoula and, um, uh, and also during this meeting, they also talked about uh, like a 120-year plan to work on the sidewalk network. So it's 120 years before we can actually get a decent sidewalk network, and by then we're probably going to uh, <laughs> not exist. I don't know, the sun will explode. I don't know, 120 years from now is just like whatever. Like it doesn't, like it, it's, it's going to be weird. But anyways, to wrap things up, we have former city council member uh, Julie Merritt uh, comment on this, who talks a little bit more about what I'm talking about as well. So sometimes we have to just commit to making improvements. There are financial options for people for whom this charge is a difficulty. They have options. They could, as Mr. Seif was just explaining, they can completely defer this until they sell the property and negotiate that with the buyer at the time of the sale. So it's not handing, some, it's not handing anyone a $9,000 bill that they have to pay right now. That is not the truth. And I want that to be clear on the record. This is something that the neighborhood wants and it should be a simple yes vote for everyone on this council. Okay, and so there you go. And that kind of uh, wraps up that part of the city council. But of course, as I've been teasing throughout the show is that we have uh, uh, Deshane uh, Bar Barnett from, um, uh, the public, uh, I mean, the uh, Missoula Health Department talking a little bit more about this, but uh, just to go back, uh, like, I'll, that's a still another tease. So now I'm going to talk, uh, so, so in terms of this vote, seven voted to approve and uh, four dissented against the project um, on financial reasons, making this construction happening in my backyard for the foreseeable future. Um, and for, you, for information, you know, there, you know, cyber parks are oh, so far and few in between anyways, and more on ongoing street improvements have been using TIFFs, but usually only occur amongst the business owners and developers site in which they utilize the TIF funds to pay for some of the sidewalks. So there's just not many uh, uh, plans to improve a lot of those sidewalks moving forward. So uh, let's see. Uh, mm, I'm just going to skip on over and I'm going to jump right into COVID. So this is the new COVID update. This is the new uh, Missoula City County Health Director Deshane Barnett talks about COVID and how the numbers are not as high as you might think, even though that they are pretty high. So as of uh, January 25th, our incidence rate here in Missoula um, is up to 212. I do want to talk just a second about this. That's a big jump, and there's a reason for that. Um, at the state level, they have changed how they are reporting cases back to the counties. So before what happened is they would send the information to us and then we would have to actually open the case on our end 
what the state has done is um, change their approach. They're they're saying that you know that since they're already doing the back end, getting all of that information ready to send to us, they're just going to go ahead and open the the cases as well. So what that's done is created in a, what's called automatic case creation, which means that now cases are are going to at least for a little bit look like they're much higher than what they have been. And that's actually not true. What it is, is we haven't been able to open as every case that we get every day. Um, we're, we're trying our best, absolutely. Um, but now that's not gonna wait, that's not gonna depend on us. So actually this number today is really inflated because yesterday was the first day that the state did automatic case creation. And so there's a lot of backlog there. Moving forward, this is actually gonna give us a more accurate picture of cases in real time. Okay, and so that accurate picture, accurate picture kind of uh, expanded a lot more in the last uh, uh, day and a half in terms of this meeting that occurred on Wednesday, and then I told you about the COVID cases that happened earlier today. So there's definitely a big spike, but then again, like you said, that the numbers are still kind of um, getting there to it more clarity in terms of how Missoula is going to be following that. But then again, you can always go to MissoulaInfo.com for more of the metrics as well. So let's go back to my notes. Um, you know, the uh, I should also really mention that the data was this was uh, from December 15, 2021. It is an update. And smaller towns and cities have uh, our base numbers on reports from hospitals, testing sites, et cetera. Missoula, cur uh, Missoula uh, County is at 64% fully vaccinated, and in many cases across the nation, also alludes to the fact that single doses are also very high in the nation, well over 75%, which is about you know three quarters of the population have at least one dose of some kind of vaccine in their bodies. So, uh, and and you know, e and another good metric as well is like over 90% of uh, those uh, 65. 74 or older are pretty much fully vaccinated. The population of concern in terms of comorbidities, it's it's good and we're on track, America. Uh, DeShane also mentions that donating blood is now more important than ever during this new strain. And so this is what he has to say. It's important for us to remember and the messaging that we want to get out is that although Omicron has the potential to be a milder variant, milder does not mean mild. This is still a variant of concern, and the Omicron variant absolutely has the capacity to cause serious COVID illness and death, and it, it, it is doing that. Um, and the best way to fight that is vaccines, and then practicing all of those um, behaviors, you know, not reducing interactions, not going places that we don't need to go. The other thing, though, is with hospital capacity where it is, it's time for us to protect our hospitals. Um, our hospitals have let us know that here in Missoula, just like nationally, we are being impacted by the shortage of blood. Um, that is actually affecting the care that our hospitals are able to give right now. Um, and so I had a meeting with St. Pat's yesterday and they are actually having to um, prioritize and, and ration the blood storage that they have available. All right, so if you are a, uh... A healthy individual and you're willing to uh, give a little bit of blood um, I suggest you do that uh, if you want to do that you can always go to you know uh, yeah any literally Google donate blood and you'll be able to do American Red Cross and do all that stuff so just uh, do your part you know I, I, when I donated blood not too long ago um, I they also they mentioned during that time is just like one of the questions they always ask you is like have you had the COVID vaccine and all that stuff just to make sure that there's a certain level because you know you never know because uh, you, you know that's just that okay that's just the thing I'm going off on a tangent but of course a lot of information is being thrown at you if you want to find the most recent up to date and just also, if you want to have your own testing kits uh, for COVID as well, you can go to uh, covidtests.gov. It is a wonderful website. Uh, this is a, basically you can get at home free tests. Uh, you can order it. You click on the order at free tests. It's, um, you put your shipping and all that stuff and they give you four, that's right, they give you four free tests just to use whenever. So if you ever feel like you're getting uh, coming down with something and you think it's COVID, you have those four testing kits to kind of work with and it's a great way for each household to have. Each person uh, who is 18 years and older can uh, 
sign up for this as well and you can get it for free and it will get mailed to your house. So uh, if you want up to date uh, information on COVID, you can go to MissoulaInfo.com or you can call them at 258-INFO for more update local information on COVID here in Missoula, Montana. All right, so that about does it for your city council report. Um, in terms of events, I'm going to kind of briefly go over a couple things here and there, but I just wanted to let you know that right now there's the Economic Outlook Seminar happening at the Hilton Garden Inn, uh, where housing is heated, uh, headed, where housing is headed, sorry, to, sorry. Uh, how will today's imbalances be re resolved? Things can go on forever, and they and usually don't. But if you are a millennial waiting for housing prices to crash so you can buy a home, you might have to wait long. The notion that today's housing price uh, situation is a bubble waiting to break is believed to be a fact. By housing prices have increased faster, and median income income almost anywhere for more than 20 years. That includes most places in Montana. So where is housing going? It's a critical question, and so this is an economic. Uh, a 2022 Economic Outlook Seminar uh, to try to understand where we are going and what actions and steps to take to have a get a better place to buy. So those are the things that are happening at the Hilton Guardian and ongoing right now. But uh, some of the things that are happening here in the library is Tiny Tale Storytime at 10.30 a.m. on the second floor is a great way for kids to learn reading uh, and, and more and get engaged with books here at the library. They have yarns and watercolor on the fourth floor at noon at the library. They also have a teen writers group in the afternoon at 3.30 p.m. But also, they also have MCAT's Photoshop lesson at 4 p.m. We have those things already signed up. But if you wanted to sign up for any of the MCAT lessons, you can call us at 542 6228, or you can go to MCAT.org for all those lessons, and you can sign up online as well. Um, paying your own pottery curbside service at 10 a.m. Zootown Arts has been uh, continuously doing this. You can inquire with them. If you wanted to do your own pottery from home, uh, you can be part of this. Their number is 549-7555. Again, that number is 549-7555. Doctor and Nurse Activity, Families First Learning Lab, here at the uh, uh, at the public library at 10 a.m. Families First Learning Lab is doing a nurse and doctor activity uh, happening today. Kid Extra Activity is also at the Families First Learning Lab from 10 to 12 in the classroom at on the second floor. Kids will be able to create and take an X-ray of their hands by using black paper and a spray bottle with the white acrylic paint. So it's a nice little. Uh, uh, arts and crafts activity that are happening as well. So uh, Liquid Stranger is happening at the Wilma tonight at 7 p.m. Uh, for History Buffs, the Missoula uh, Public Library is hosting a surprise lecture tonight at 7 p.m. Uh, it's History Buffs from 7 to 9 p.m. It's going to be a Cooper Room uh, Level 4 from 7 to 9 p.m. You have some live music featuring Josh Farmer and a uh, piano band. And finally, you have Union Club going to be having the benevolence happening as well. So if you're interested in Saturday drop-ins, uh, MCAT does a Saturday drop-ins for kids uh, for stop animation, movie making, and stuff like that from 1 to 3. Kids age about 8 to about 14. It is a great way for kids to get involved with that. If you're also interested in learning more about MCAT, we have orientations every Saturday at 10 a.m. and also Mondays at Monday nights at 5.30 p.m. But I also saw that we also are doing orientation Wednesday nights at 6.45. Uh, the, very unclear because uh, I just learned about it the other day when I actually had to do it on Wednesday. But regardless of that, we also have our Spring Flicks uh, Camp Live on our website, I believe. Uh, so we'll go to MCAT.org, and you can find the link where you can sign up your kid to any of uh, for uh, for spring break camp. So if you have a kid between 8 and 14, and you're worried about them doing anything during spring break, uh, we have a spring break camp on our website at MCAT.org. So that about does it for my morning show, and I wanted to thank you guys for joining me. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramph.